Okay, well, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence again as we continue to study on the Sabbath. We ask for your care and protection in our lives and that your Holy Spirit can speak to us. Help us to draw close to you and to one another that we can reflect your character in all that we do. Help us to understand the things we study and to apply them to our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning and happy Sabbath again to everyone. So in this study, we're continuing with the study of The Crisis Ahead by Robert W. Olson, which we studied in the upper room studies in the attic of my house back in uh, 1985. So we're going to continue reading here. It's dealing with uh, persecution and the other causes of the shaking. So he asked this question, besides persecution, what other causes are there for the shaking of God's people? And a lot of these statements we're very familiar with. This one from early writings we've read many times. I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen and was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. Now, if we just read that statement, we would say that the shaking is caused by the straight testimony which is called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. And that is, of course, the message to the Laodicean church. Counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest, that thy nakedness may be clothed in the shame of thy nakedness. Clothed, however it words it. And to anoint thine eyes with eyes out, that thou mayest see. Right? Because we're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So there's four different... Uh, conditions and there's three different remedies so that represents the progressive destruction of four and the three angels messages now it says here this will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth so the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans is going to have an effect upon those that receive this message Right. Hopefully that's us. And then it says some will not bear this straight testimony. They will rise up against it. And this is what will cause a shaking among God's people. So when we look at this whole statement, the shaking is, let's say we could say it's precipitated by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. But its cause that is. What actually causes the shaking is the fact that many resist it. They rise up against it. So the shaking is not caused by those who receive the truth. They're not responsible for what happens in the church. It's those that reject the message that are going to be responsible, right? That they're actually going to cause. Okay, so there's five. Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Okay, there's five, not four. Why did I think there was four? Okay, anyway, there's five and three. Okay, now the next statement, God's spirit has illuminated every page of holy writ, but there are those upon whom it makes little impression because it is imperfectly understood. When the shaking comes, and here it says, by the introduction of false theories, these surface readers anchored nowhere are like shifting sand. They slide into any position to suit the tenor of their feelings of bitterness. So one of the things that we see that I believe is actually happening in the movement today. So conservatives generally take the position that, um, you know, the messages to Laodicean church, we're not really the Laodiceans. It's really those other people there who teach new theology and all that kind of stuff. So so they're really the, the Laodiceans. And um, and we're going to come and we're going to give this message. And and they're going to stand up and resist it and leave. Right. So it, it's it's pretty much a self-righteous Laodicean sort of attitude we have about who is a Laodicean. We, we know that we're Laodiceans. It's not them who are Laodiceans, right? Because we're the ones who need the remedy. And and if we don't consider ourselves Laodiceans, then the remedy doesn't apply to us. And we know that it does. 
So we need to recognize that we're wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Okay? And then it says that there is going you, to be... What's that? I want, sorry, okay. I had to get to my mute. Okay. Amen. And that's all I wanted to say to what you were saying was amen. Okay. So true. And then what we have is that when the shaking comes by the introduction of false theories. Now, have we seen the introduction of false theories multiplied exponentially uh, since 9-11, for instance? I know not all of you have had an experience. I'm not sure which list them off. Uh, which ones are you uh, thinking of? I'm not sure. Okay, we got, now, we had, so if we go back, you know, in into the 1990s and you looked at conservative Adventism, there wasn't a lot of strange ideas floating around, at least in my experience. I mean, you, there might have been the beginning of some feast keeping stuff, but that was pretty marginalized, wasn't uh, taken very seriously. Uh, there was some um, holy flesh stuff with life supports out of uh, Washington. The Jubilees. Well, yeah, there was. There was some time saying Jim stuff. Jones, or no, not Jim Jones, but wasn't Waco during that time as well? But that wasn't really, well, it was connected to the church in a way. Yeah, but, okay, but but these are still kind of marginalized views, right? Right, if, if true. Were, well, so now yeah. within Adventism, we got anti-Trinitarianism, Lunar Sabbaths, Flat Earths, extreme views on Millerite understandings. Um, there's just it's just been multiplied again and again, all kinds of extreme views. Now, of course, some people might say, you know, we're part of that. But, uh, you know, we know we're not right. We know that our views are uh, based upon the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. They're well thought out. They're not just, you know, wild eyed ideas. But that has existed within our movement. Of course, we understand to some degree why conspiracy theories have have been uh, fed with uh, what has happened since 2020. You know, obviously, people's trust in sources and and information and who to trust, all of that has just been totally uh, fractured. So, so when we have this introduction of false theories, one of the things that I believe is that God is giving us a message and we use these different ideas as a way of avoiding recognizing our spiritual condition, right? That is, if we are in the know of some special idea, some specific idea, we can think that we're all good because, you know, obviously we know things other people don't. And, and that was true of the 2520. Many people who accepted the 2520 had this type of attitude about it. And we saw how they acted as time went on. Many of them either renounced the 2520 and went off into other uh, areas of darkness, you know, something, whatever the church was unhappy with at the time was their favorite uh, doctrine, right? So some people, it's just to be in opposition to others. Not that I can judge any individual, but we can definitely see the fruit of, of people who are constantly changing what, new idea they're promoting, right? So we all know people like that who are constantly moving from one thing to the other. So they're anchored nowhere. Mm -hmm. They're like shifting mm -hmm. sand. Yeah, Kelly? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I would offer that a person, <clears throat> in my experience, um, I may not think that I'm better than, but that the gaining of knowledge becomes the goal itself rather than to gain knowledge for deeper insights into myself and my condition. So people may not, it, it serves to, as a distraction from what God really gives us knowledge for, for mm -hmm. a, an, an understanding of our relationship between, between him and us and between us. Yeah. Yeah. So the reason we, we study to learn things is not so that we can think that we're better than other people who don't understand what we understand. Now, often People will think that that's what I'm doing. I know people accuse me of that all the time. Well, you know, you just know a bunch of stuff and you think you're better than me sort of thing. And it's like, 
No, I don't actually. And I try to understand the truth and I try to be open to understanding uh, where I'm wrong. Because to me, I just value the truth because it's reality. And that if I'm going to be a part of God's kingdom, I, I, it needs to be based upon reality and truth, not some feeling or fancy or, or um, you know, whim or desire. It, 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 and it's going to cut cr- contrary to my nature. So many times we have to be humbled uh, because we know so little. And and coming into this movement and studying this message, I mean, it's been a very humbling experience. It's not been something that would make me think that I'm better than other people. But I do know that there are many who, uh, because of their jealousy, demonstrate that that's what they value, right? And and so when people are, are, you know, certain behaviors, I guess we can say, you know, we're going to bring up specific examples, but we can demonstrate by how we react to opposition, how we react to criticism, what kind of spirit we are of. So if we look at what God's spirit has illuminated every page of Holy Writ, right, there are some that that doesn't make much impression upon them. That is, we have all this light coming to us, and it doesn't make much impression because it's not understood Right. It's imperfectly understood. So understanding, having knowledge and understanding of the scriptures is extremely important if we're going to be anchored. Right. Because the study in the the scriptures is a knowledge of Christ. Right. We're seeking to know God. We're seeking to know God's will for us. We're seeking to understand Christ's character. Christ is standing at the door and knocking. And we have to get rid of that rubbish in front of the door so that he can come in and that he can clean up, right? We can't make ourselves better. We need Christ in our heart, in our lives, showing us what is real. And we have to admit that we've lived under a delusion for a long time in our lives of what we think about ourselves and what we think about others and what we think about the Bible. And We're like Peter. We're saying, Lord, you know, I will not deny thee. They'll also all forsake me. And yet we're no different than Peter in that regard is that we we have no true appreciation of of what it is we're facing. And we have no true appreciation of our own weaknesses. So the shaking comes because we have problems. Right. And unless we hold on to Christ, we will be shaken out. So. And just in the comparing these two paragraphs. Okay. Yeah. Because they um, give you two different reasons, right? Yeah, because one that's straight truth is causing the shaking. And then the other one is false theories that is causing the shaking. Mm-hmm. So it seems like almost what causes the shaking is it a, it seems like a contradiction. Well, yeah, except that the straight truth testimony which is the message to the Laodiceans, it, it's going to cause the shaking because it's going to have an effect upon those who receive it, right? And when they are changed and give their, they, they, they pour forth the straight truth, there's going to be those who react against it. And it's the rising up against this straight testimony that causes the shaking, right? But you can see how that's related to uh, when the shaking comes, right? By the oh, interest of all series, the surface readers. So you can see that this is a way that people who have, are, are, they're being presented with the truth, how they're going to avoid the truth, right? So it doesn't really say that the introduction of false theories causes the shaking directly. It says when the shaking comes, By the introduction of false theories, these surface readers anchored nowhere are like shifting sand, right? So it's just showing that there's this straight truth and and that's supposed to bring a conviction, right? The true witness of the lay decedents brings a conviction to those that receive it. They're going to uh, pour forth the straight truth, but the ones who are shaken out 
they're going to be clinging to their false theories, right? Instead of to Christ. Right. So you're saying when the shaking comes by the introduction of false theories, that it's, they're kind of like, a, that the false theories are in some way directly causing that shaking. Right. It, it's what causes people to be shaken out because they are clinging to these false theories instead of to the straight testimony. Okay. Right. Could you see anything with what Conrad found is happening with what is to them the straight, no, causing a shaking relating to these here paragraphs? Okay. Well, so, since I haven't seen, I mean, I've only just had a very cursory uh, explanation of what Conrad Ryan presented. So uh, can you can you give me a more complete, I guess, way of what, what you think the main points of what Conrad Vine presented and what the reaction was? And... Yeah, so when the, the mandates came out, yeah. there was this ad com statement uh, sort of relating to liberty of conscience. That... Right, so the church, so the church uh, did not allow us to have freedom of conscience. That's that's what he says, yes. Yeah. But the church would say, no, this wasn't our policy or something. So to me, all the comments when I'm reading about it are very much supportive of Conrad Vine. Uh, he's because given it, because it, he's people done. were really felt that the church had done the wrong thing. Yeah, so people have not been able to hold their, have lost their jobs or else mm-hmm. they've taken rather than lose their jobs. And he says position is with the GC that they're more interested in aligning themselves with the government and yeah. the state funding. So they don't want to uh, to have anything there that would stop the, the government funding the church. But they're, the consequence of that is they're going to throw people underneath the bus, in a sense, so to speak. Uh, mm-hmm. they, they don't really want to, they don't care people get the because of that statement. And then they are going to be, maybe have some side effects. Or, you know, he gives one example where someone had some bad reaction to it and can't work now. And his mother's yeah. having to look after him. She had to give up her job and, and things like that there. And then many others have just, rather than take, have just uh, lost her job. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I have a guy who uh, used to be a guitar student of mine and, and, uh, he was faced with either you lose your job or you get, so he got, but he ended up not being able to work anyway because he was so sick from the, but, you know, of course, uh, you know, we have to be careful what we say here on YouTube when we post this, but all we're saying is that this issue is really about the freedom of conscience within the church. Now, so how does this relate to the shaking so in your idea? How does this relate to the shaking? Well, it's a, a lot of uh, response from the church has been to sort of cancel Conrad Vine. So he has been banned from the pulpit of the Michigan Conference. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Bohr had him a meeting, a camp meeting prepared, and he was going to speak at it. And then he uh, removed him from the speakers. So yeah. I think a lot of people have said, well, I want my money back because I was going to hear Conrad Vine. In a sense, there's, there's like a, a support issue with Conrad Vine. Yeah. You know, so it's kind of... Okay, well, so as far as the the shaking is concerned, I don't think that that's really what the shaking's about, right? So so when I look at this uh, exalting the standard and pouring forth the straight truth, I don't see this in the context of what's going on right now. That is, this is something much more, right? I actually would think a lot of this uh, this other stuff is more about false theories. So even though we might say, well, we agree with Conrad Vine that, you know, the church shouldn't uh, infringe upon our freedom of conscience and so forth. Um, So we can see the injustice of it. For some people, these become the main issues, right? In this message to the Laodiceans is not a message about other people's bad spiritual conditions. It's a message to us about our spiritual condition. And my, my view is that many conservatives who who stand for the truth in their minds, and in a lot of ways they do, uh, will be shaken out because of false 
theories that they hold on to. Like this next, st next statement in six testimonies, not having received the love of the truth, they will be taken in by the delusions of the enemy. They will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils and will depart from the faith. Now, she's not laying out exactly what these are. And of course, she's just quoting a Bible verse. But for the most part here, right? Uh, but the delusions of the enemy. There's so many delusions. There's delusions fit for every person. What those delusions do is they make us think we're better than we are. They're a way of avoiding seeing ourselves as sinners. And they can come in all kinds of forms, right? Forms that are even mostly truth. And, and that's really where the danger lies. Like we need to see our true spiritual condition. We need to have Christ come into our life to clean up our lives and not focus upon, because often when people are focusing upon the problems of the church and the injustices that occur, the way of experience personally, it takes their focus upon really where the real enemy is, that real enemy that lurks inside each one of us. And that's really the danger, I, I believe, right? That uh, So this shaking is, you know, the true counsel of uh, the witness, the, the message to the Laodiceans, the true counsel of the message to the Laodiceans that, that comes into our life is going to be a powerful, convicting testimony to those around us. And some of them will respond, but many of them will resist and be caught off, carried off by many different types of delusions. Now, we saw it happen within this movement to a large degree, correct? And, and the people who, who the people who were deluded, who believed that they were in the right, they acted in an extremely unchristlike way towards their brethren. And, and and we have to be careful that we don't follow that same path. Okay, so what expression does Mrs. White use to describe the, this experience? In the mighty sifting soon to take place, we shall be better able to measure the strength of Israel. The signs reveal that the time is near when the Lord will manifest that his fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor. So, of course, that's a symbol of, of this, the, this, um, the sifting and the shaking and the blowing away of the chaff and all that. Right. So cleaning up the wheat. So we can say like the wheat and the tares as well are connected to that. Has our entire church membership ever been composed of true Christians? Now, this, this goes back to an issue that existed within this movement regarding the tares, which Parminder had presented. Um, and it led to this view that, uh, you know, we're going to have this, this church that's not going to have any tares in it. And, of course, uh, that's what they believe they have now, I guess, Parminder's group. From what has been shown me, there is not more than half of the young who profess religion and the truth who have been truly converted. So it's obviously the young and they profess religion and the truth, uh, not more than half, right? So that's, I think, pretty generous, but um, and that's in 1857, right? So it's a long time ago. Names are registered upon the church books upon earth, but not in the book of life. I saw that there's not one in 20 of the youth who knows what experimental religion is. So that's 1867. Now, I know of, of a pastor who believes that if your name is not on the church records, you will be lost, a friend of mine. He says, you know, you need to be concerned. If you get disfellowshipped, you're, you're going to be lost. So obviously, I would say that obviously having your name on the books, that doesn't mean that you're, you know, that doesn't mean anything, right? That's what she's saying. Uh, but having your name in the book of life is what really matters. In the last vision given me, I was shown the startling fact that but a small portion of those who now profess the truth will be sanctified by it and saved. So I'm not sure how small a small portion is, what percentage, but she was given a vision uh, in 1867. I've stated before that from what was shown me, but a small number of those now professing to believe the truth would eventually be saved. 1870. I will tell you not a few ministers who stand before the people to explain the scriptures are defiled. Their hearts are corrupt and their hands unclean. So if it's not a few, that would be many, exactly how many in 1882. We know um, that's the time of 
uh, five testimonies. As you can see, it's from five testimonies, which Heidi and I read through. And it's one of the, the most, uh, the strongest rebukes that you ever see against the church are actually in five testimonies. Uh, so the condition of the church in the 1880s was, was quite bad. It is a solemn statement that I make to the church that not one in 20 whose names are registered upon the church books are prepared to close their earthly history and would be as verily without God and without hope in the world as the common sinner. sinner. So in 1893, less than 5% of those whose names are registered upon the church books would be saved. It's, it's not a very good uh, stat. Now, is that any different today? Is it worse? Is it better? I, I mean, I would think it's probably worse, but I would say very few people. And, and that's a hard thing to think about, you know, because there's many people we love and care for. Um, but, you know, if we're really honest, we can see many of them don't care about the truth by how they live their lives. And many of us, really, we don't, even though we spend time going to Bible studies and and, and so forth, there's, there's problems in our lives that we're unwilling to address. In the days of ease and prosperity, which we are now enjoying, what can we expect to develop in our church? Prosperity multiplies a mass of professors. Adversity purges them out of the church, for Testimonies 89. And divisions will come in the church. Two parties will be developed. The wheat and the tares grow up together for the harvest. When the mighty shifting takes place, what will become of the unconsecrated members of our church. When the day comes, when the law of God is made void and the church is sifted by the fiery trials that are to try all that live upon the earth, a great proportion of those who are supposed to be genuine will give heed to seducing spirits and will turn traitors and betray sacred trusts. They will prove our very worst persecutors. Now, some of us may have experienced this already, in people that once profess to believe the truth and how they can become uh, very bitter enemies of the truth. Um, but, and this would relate to that quote dealing with, you know, all these different uh, sort of uh, errors that, that come in. So this give heed to seducing spirits. But even just in how we talk to each other and communicate, um, the shutting down of people that we disagree with, the gossip and rumors. These are very satanic things. Kelly, do you have a comment? A couple of them. Okay. The idea of not having our name on the books is its such a Catholic idea uh, to be in fear of being excommunicated. Mm -hmm. To a Catholic, that was, that was eternal damnation. Um, One is you couldn't you couldn't have a proper burial, and you know, and so or a marriage or a, or a bapti baptism of your child, yeah. your children would okay. be lost. But if you can't get buried, and then you know you're just going to be in purgatory, I guess, and eventually hell or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, um, a lot of a lot of fear and threat in it. The other the other thing is uh, <clears throat> that experience of of uh, people turning. There, there, it's like there's a well, there is a dark spirit that comes over them. Um, like I watched a physical change in the faces of the people that I had gone to the house of the Lord with for, for years when at my disfellowship. These were people that I knew that I ate dinner with at their homes and many church dinners and potlucks and events and sat beside in church, uh, held church office with them. And, Served the church and uh, the their faces literally changed, like from pleasant to to angry, a sense of anger. They were angry at me, and they didn't. <clears throat> I don't think they understood. They didn't see the see it the way I was able to see it from the front, looking out onto them. And it was only not. It was just such an experience. Yeah, such an experience. And that's the experience that we all will face standing for truth. Um, and read uh, what happened with Stephen at his trial. They gnashed upon him with their teeth. Like, they're really, really vicious. Yeah, so so we know, I mean, we saw in this movement what happened. Um, to me, it's, it's, it's very, very sad.
but but the the great danger is is ourselves right so right now we know the only person that we can deal with is ourselves we're the only ones who can whose salvation we can truly affect right it's placed into our hands god's given us the free will to choose life or death you know we can try to fool others but we definitely can't fool god we might even be able to fool ourselves to some degree though if we're you know if we we're honest we can see that that there's lots in us that needs to change. But, you know, this next statement, many a star that we have admired for its brilliance will then go out in darkness. Now, we know, of course, people can appear to be godly, but harbor all kinds of things that that, that they are able to hide from others. And, and we have that ability as well. We also know that there are going to be people in God's kingdom that we will be surprised that they are there. Because we can't look into the heart. We don't see what things people struggle with. Um, well, here's one, bringing it home personally, uh, in the application to self. I smoked cigarettes for probably a good 10, 15 years in church. I even helped facilitate a stop smoking program. But nobody knew I was smoking. I would wash my hands and face. I would make sure to wear clothes that didn't smell like cigarettes. I mean, people were shocked when I, when I really, you know, became honest. Yeah. And that was, that was, I wasn't doing drugs at the time or I wasn't act in an active addiction, but I, smoking was the hardest one for me, but to, to, to break free from, but yes, yeah. that was my closet. Well, uh, well, Hiding things for, I know a person, you know her, but uh, I'm not going to say who she is. But uh, she hid from her boyfriend that she was an alcoholic and they dated for a couple of years. You know, people can hide things. We can hide things from others and we can try to hide them from ourselves and think that they don't matter, but they have to be dealt with. And right now we're in probationary time. We have that opportunity to heed the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. And not deflect it and think that it's somebody else's responsibility. One of the indicators of when I'm doing that, which I always want to bring it to me because I can't speak for anyone else's experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Theodore. Always turning it back to this message is for us personally, Isaiah's experience and so on. Um, so one of the indicators is that I'm focused on someone else's behavior i'm talking to others about someone else's behavior um that you know the counselors here are really good about well we, we don't really we're not really here to talk about them what about you How, what are you thinking and feeling right now about that yeah. and god's really good at it. and god is does that for us yeah, stops us somebody. in our tracks shows yeah. us our sin and humbles us in the dust if we be willing. Yeah. Now, if we will walk into brick walls and God will try to, you know, shake us up and wake us up, you know, from our sleepwalking. Uh, but but the reality, the reality is, is that sometimes we have silenced God's voice so much that it hardly brings a conviction to us. We can continue on in sin and, and justify it every step of the way. Nobody knows the things that I do. Nobody knows what I really am. And um, and think somehow just by fooling others, we can fool God. Chaff like a cloud will be borne away on the wind, even from places where we see only floors of rich wheat. So there's the appearances of righteousness that really don't amount to anything. The shaking of God blows away multitudes like dry leaves. In the last solemn work, few great men will be engaged, right? And, you know, and I think about this when we were studying this in the upper room back in the mid-1980s, you know, as I was a new Adventist and I'm reading these statements, you know, I, I really became to recognize uh, that that this work, so, so just to, you know, for people who maybe are watching this don't know me that well, but, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much an anti-establishment guy. I always have never really, um, I'm not a team player, right? At least that's what they, you know, my teachers wrote in my report cards. They didn't say team player, but, you know, he doesn't work well. well with the next part of the program. Yeah. 
So, so I have this difficulty that, that I have this natural tendency not to want to cooperate with other people and just to be independent. But when I became an Adventist, I recognized the necessity of fellowship with believers who were different than me. And I, I understood that being a Seventh-day Adventist, I couldn't just go by my nature of what I wanted. And, and I learned so much by being a part of a church. Now, you know, with what's happening in all of these statements that sort of appeal to my nature, <laughs> you know, this idea that, uh, well, you know, this work is, 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 you know, the work of unity is an, in, is an individual work. Uh, one of my statements, you know, am I just, is I, am I just using this as a cop out? You know, what's happened in the church? Should I be more submissive? You, you understand what I'm saying? That, that we all have different dangers that that fit our characters. And so, you know, I work really, really hard at communicating with other sp people, spending time talking to people, meeting strangers, which is not easy for me, and talking to people on the street, not easy for me. Uh, but I work hard at it because I understand the importance of it, that I, you know, no man is an island. Um, I have this, this influence on people around me. And I also need to be influenced. I need to be challenged, right? I need to be held accountable to others, right? No, I don't like being held accountable to others. That's kind of what I said. That's kind of what I said. <clears throat> what I said when you asked me to do a presentation. I don't like being responsible. <laughs> yeah, I hate responsibility. Yeah, okay. Uh, of course, uh, of course, we all hate responsibility, but we all have to accept it. Yes. Yeah. Well, I don't think all people. There's some people that really like responsibility. They they want to be they want to be on the boards. They want to be they want to have their say all the time. And I just wish everybody would just leave me alone. Positions of power. Like my my natural my my nature is I definitely don't like positions of power. Um, but they thought you ain't the only one that feels that way. I know. There's other people like like me as well. You know. They, I mean, yeah. Me too. So, yeah, uh, I remember reading about uh, Moses and, and being a leader, and uh, or no, I remember thinking of myself as a leader uh, as a as a young young man, a teenager even. Yeah, and uh, then I read about Moses' experience of forty years in the wilderness, and I I said to God, "Well, I don't really think I want to be a leader if that's what what it takes." And sure enough. He's taken me into the wilderness for a while. I'm coming out, and I'm not sure if I'm a leader or not, but I'm definitely humbled. Well, and that's what a leader re is really required, to be able to lead well, like a shepherd. Be a servant yeah. of all. Yeah, well, the thing is, there's such a great burden of responsibility, you know, when you, when you understand the truth. It, it's not pleasant. Like, I can tell you, you know, when the July 18, 2020 thing happened, that was not very pleasant for me uh, to be in that position that there's something that I presented that other people were following. And, you know, I didn't want to deceive anyone. Right. Like, it, 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 I don't know if anybody can, you know, if you've been in that situation, it, it, it was not not a pleasant situation. It's not where I wanted to be. I, I didn't I didn't ask to be in that uh, situation. I just ended up there and even doing these studies. It wasn't really something that I, I planned. Okay, but did, did William Miller and the 300 that presented from the charts at that time, didn't they also end up in that same situation on October 22nd, 1844? Well, yeah, right. So, so you end up in that situation because God leads you there, but it doesn't mean you want to be there. Right? Do you think Christ really wanted to be hung upon the cross? No, no. Okay, so so this question here: What percentage of our Seventh Day Adventist Church membership will apostatize? Well, I don't know if Ellen White's going to give an exact percentage, but uh, soon God's people will be tested by fiery trials, and the great proportion of those who now appear to be genuine and true will prove to be base metal. And we, and we've seen that happen within this movement. We've seen it happen in different situations. To stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us, 
to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few? This will be our test. At this time, we must gather warmth from the coldness of others, courage from their cowardice, and loyalty from their treason. And, and what I take from that last sentence is that prophesy, and we see what's happening around us. We can, can be encouraged, right? Because Jesus said these things, they happen to me, they'll happen to you. And so there can be an encouragement, but it's definitely not not what any of us desire. And the law of God yeah, is I'm evil. She means, sorry, Theodore, I was thinking, because I'm going through a lot of trials, you know, but I'm getting a lot, lot, lot of victories. I'm thinking, I was thinking about this quote a few days ago, and I'm thinking, it's the contrast. Like, how can you, de you know, derive warmth from somebody's coldness? Well, you choose to live in contrast to that. Mm -hmm. You know, like with me, because I'm very combative by 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 nature and 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 vindictive. I'm learning really? not not to retaliate the way I've been treated. So it's and I found out that that's a real crucifixion of self, and I'm thankful for it. Now my main battle is my thought processes, like mm -hmm. not even to retaliate in my mind. Ah. And that's what this is an ongoing is. battle with me because yeah I know what you're talking about and I and I'm thinking this is only mild mild persecution if I don't learn how to cope with this and I can only do it with Christ how am I going to stand when really heavy worldwide persecution begins will I even be alive at that at that time yeah well it's kind of interesting when I was in Australia Felix talked a lot about you know our thoughts, that there's this battleground in our thoughts. And at the time, you know, I said to him, well, you know, I don't think I really have that difficulty. But since then, I've had that difficulty. So I think God just made me aware of something that was going on inside of me that I wasn't, I wasn't paying attention to. So, so we need to be, you know, it starts in our thoughts, right? What we, what we pay attention to in God's word and, uh, you know, so sometimes it, it takes a while for the thinking patterns to show up in in our behavior. And so, you know, yeah, you don't want to start thinking about it. you can think, oh, I can just fantasize about, you know, getting back at this other person and it's it's not going to affect me or something. But, you know, we need to one is to show warmth when others are cold. Right. Mm -hmm. To be courageous mm -hmm. when others are and to be loyal, even when we are betrayed. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm loyal to to him, and I'm not going to be loyal loyal to to, to folks who hate Christ. Who don't yes, want exactly. I'm not saying being loyal to the person. And the person this is what they is. want. You see, they want me to capitulate. They want me to be just like them, and I absolutely refuse to. I don't want right. to be lost. But for all I know, these people are lost. I believe one of them certainly is. Well, but I mean, the Lord knows for sure, right? This yeah, experience, but, this experience is something that I've. It brought forth a prayer. I've had, I've read it, I've thought about it, but I experienced mm -hmm. it recently. And that my prayer was, Lord, make me like Jesus, who Satan found nothing in him, nothing in right. him that would respond, respond, you know, badly to these people, either in thought or action. And yeah, that's well, and that's, that's a pretty good prayer. Is, like, that's that's. That's what we need. Yeah. Do you think Jesus? Was Amen. Ever, do you think Jesus was ever annoyed by anyone? I know he was at times. No. Well, I, I don't think so. I don't think he was ever no. annoyed. I think because, he was. Well, I don't. You need a even as a faith. child, no, even I'm as a sure. child, Ellen. No. Just a moment. J just a moment. No, no. Just a moment. Tell me I'll settle this for us. Um, even uh, Ellen White speak. <laughs> Ellen White even speaks of Jesus being bullied as a child by his own brothers mm -hmm. yeah. and that he was just a happy he, he, there was nothing in him that responded to the evil in this world nothing they found uh, the devil found nothing in him they, he wouldn't have, would, he wouldn't have been yeah, he wouldn't annoyed have been or otherwise a, he wouldn't have been the perfect savior if he had any um, things against anybody yeah. The reason, I mean, it depends what I guess a person means by annoyed. But when I think of annoyed, it's it's because something about me is being, it, it, there's a problem with me. If I'm annoyed with somebody, I know that it has something to do. There's something in me that's causing me to be annoyed. 
No, I mean, you know, it's obviously if somebody's like punching me in the head, you know, that's not necessarily a problem. That's not annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could be annoyed. quite annoying if they keep punching you in the head over and over. It's a little more but, than annoying, I'm saying. <laughs> but, but you understand what I'm saying. So, so there is a way in which people do innocent sort of things, or maybe they have habits or, you know, there's, there's things about them that I just don't like and I find annoying. Well, I need to focus upon why am I annoyed, right? Because, you know, I should care for that other person. And, and when you're annoyed, you don't really care for the other person. Um, sometimes you wish they didn't exist, right? So, so that's what I just want to have to, you have just, to what I mean by annoyed, right? Or just want to abandon them and leave the situation. Right. Like I've, I experienced that a couple of days ago. Boy, I tell you, it's... So, so Christ cared yeah. cared for everyone, no matter even the the Pharisees and the scribes. Now, of course, he he spoke boldly about them, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. But it's not that he didn't care for them, and it's not that he was just annoyed and they were bothering him, and you know he's lashing out, right? Well, it was sin. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, you know, and and when you see it so flagrant all around you. And you see people deliberately choosing to serve Satan and to yield to Christ and to just surrender day by day to Christ. But then you yeah, should, it, I, it I got an, is annoying. I have, it's more than annoying. Yeah, it's exasperating. I, ha, I have an answer. You can weep over those that you know, are heading for I have an answer. But, that, that doesn't mean I'm not going to be angry at what they're doing. I well, I'm answer, just learning uh, not to show it, just to withdraw from the whole thing and pray for them that they'll finally come to their senses. Well, I think, I think, is, may I? Okay, Kelly, may I? Kelly, you yeah. settle this argument here. <laughs> well, it's just that <laughs> I, I specifically prayed asking God about hatred because I had this hate in my heart. And so I asked God, I said, should I hate anything? And he led me to the scripture. Very simple. Hate sin. And that's Not the sin. only thing that God yeah. hates. He hates sin, not evil. Yeah. And hate, sin and leads out. sin leads to evil, but he he doesn't hate the evil. He doesn't hate the wicked. He loves them, but he yeah, hates sin. That's, that's he hates sin, which is not the person. Yeah, it's not the person or the action. It, it's it's the substance of sin, which only God understands. That's what we are to hate in ourselves and others. For, well, you know, mm -hmm. it's difficult to separate the sin from the person, but we are to hate the sin and love them yeah, and I, pray I, for I'm them so in fervor. to do that after 10 yeah. months of this onslaught. I'm... Okay. So when the law of God is made void, the church will be sifted by fiery trials. And a larger portion than we now anticipate will give heed to the to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So we know that it's it's going to be the majority, right? The majority will forsake us. So I guess that's the percentage. Okay. We'll all unconcentrate, unconcentrated, unconsecrated Seventh-day Adventists be shaken out of the church in this period of trial before probation closes. Those professed believers who come up to the time of trouble unprepared will, in their despair, confess their sins before all, in words of burning anguish, while the wicked exult over their distress, the case of all such is hopeless. When Christ stands up and leaves the most holy place, then the time of trouble commences, and the case of every soul is decided. So I'm not sure how this question, how this answer, this statement relates directly to the question, because um, the question is, are they shaken out before the close of probation? So this seems to me like there are some who, after the close of probation, because when probation closes, do we know probation is closed? We will not know. No, we we we, we won't know. It's not it's not announced from heaven out loud, right? Probation will close, and and we will over time be able to discern that it has closed. Okay. The the wicked, okay, the wicked will not know because is that right? Uh, they will go on marrying and well, the wicked will not because they don't even know about the close of probation or whatever. You know, like yeah, okay. Um, but I, I don't think that we even know 
Illinois, I can't, I don't have the statement quoted memory, you know, in my memory or where it is, but basically that, that we will, we will discern it. And, and it same has to do with the Holy Spirit being poured out, right? It's not like we have some event that we can mark and we can know, you know, the Holy Spirit's now been poured out or probation is closed. But there's that, qu- there's that discern- question. Of, I'll, I'll let you finish in a sec. Just, just interject that there's that quote. She says that we're not to concern ourselves about whether we will be one of the 144,000, but she says you will know soon enough. So she, there is something about that. Yeah, but that that's sort of a different issue, and there's a little bit of different context to that because people are sort of trying to figure out who are the 144,000. Basically, she's just saying, you know, don't worry about it. It's not an important point. But right. I, I think it's, this more has yeah. to do with um, the question is, when probation closes, there will still be some people who are professing to be Adventists, but... Um, they're unprepared for what's coming and and they've held on to some sins and uh, even though they now decide to confess those sins it's too late and this would be like Aiken's confession right remind so, me of what Aiken's Aiken confession was the one who did the battle with the department right so he finally mm-hmm. gets down to you know they, they cast lots and they find which tribe and which family and finally it comes down to him and then he admits his sin, right? You know, instead of just saying, well, I'm the one who sinned. He, he's got to wait until he's finally discovered. So I think uh, that's... Uh, yeah. Right. Confession forced from his lips. Yeah. And and so we ha- now have this opportunity. God is calling on each one of us to recognize in us the things that have hindered our walk with him, that have hindered our influence, and these are not easy things, right? Because obviously, if they were easy, we would already have dealt with them, right? So these are the hard things in our lives that uh, we have not dealt with. And and we have these truths that we have studied that give us an opportunity to examine ourselves and to be honest with ourselves and to bring a conviction that God's power is able to do what God is able to do, what he claims to do, Right. And so, you know, that that is to be, you know, hopefully this week ahead as we spend time, you know, studying and praying and going through the experiences that we're going to take a deeper look at ourselves and not get caught up in what's happening out there that we have no control over. Okay, so um, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? This uh, experience, which I'm going through this chapter in my life, has been Mm -hmm. what I'm saying could be summed up as the process of sanctification yeah. and it is an in, inside work and yeah. it's so oh, it's man. so good i love god so much yeah but it's hard right it's not yep. easy crucifixion of self okay well thanks for that Kelly. Dying, let's dying to yourself the greatest battle that was ever fought the dear father oh. we thank you lord for the time we've had together this sabbath And we just pray that you can bring us together again to study your word and to fellowship. We pray that to the remaining hours of the Sabbath, that they can be used uh, to contemplate these things, to enjoy the things that you have made, and um, to give us rest from our labors, both physical and, and the other types of labors that we have, our own righteousness. Give us rest from that and help us rest in Christ. Be with each person. May your angels watch over and protect them. Be with our family and friends and help us, Lord, uh, to reflect your character to everyone around. Thank you again for all things, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.